Right. Um, back onto it. Um, can everyone see? Yes. Amazing. Um, but That's before great. that, uh, I want to quickly go over the keys to my scientific journey as an international woman in STEM. Um, firstly, I highly, I heavily relied on scholarships, um, which is what I got for my undergrad and what many international students have to rely on to study here in the UK. Um, during my undergrad, I applied for internships and positions uh, to get experience. Uh, this is essentially padding out your CV, um, but make, uh, as well as making sure to enjoy yourself at the same time. And grades, um, had to get good ones. I worked really hard and it was really tough, um, but I managed to be top of my class. It turns out I really like geophysics. <laughs> Um, so I wasn't sure about doing a PhD, so I opted for a master's by research instead. I uh, had to go out of pocket, uh, shout out to my parents, um, but there was a 10% alumni discount from the university I was in, so yay. Um, I decided that I loved research, um, so I applied for a PhD. Um, it was quite sad noticing the number of female students around me seemed to grow obviously small as we slowly transition from undergrad to PhD. Um, and But I count myself quite lucky to have one of my closest friends from undergrad follow a similar path. And is now a PhD student like me. Shout out to Kat Dupree. <laughs> so, um, it's difficult for an international student to get a PhD here uh, because of how much the international fees are and the limited funding available for international students. But I would say to anyone that's considering a master's and the PhD out there to openly talk to the right people about what you want to research early on. Uh, search for scholarships and hopefully the supervisor you want to work with can find additional funding for you. Okay, uh, internships. I did some work during my second and third year, uh, face picking data from ocean bottom seismometers uh, and from a passive uh, monitoring of a CO2 injection site. I got uh, summer internships with the university uh, by emailing my undergrad professor, uh, Professor Mike Hendel, uh, that's him in the yellow jacket, that I was interested in doing some geophysics work. I told him that I was keen to do some coding and to help with extra tasks that like postdocs need to do, like seismic phase picking. Uh, basically, this is the time for you to explore what you like to do and if research is right for you. It was really amazing um, have, having super smart women like Dr. Ophelia George, who is an expert in geophysical uh, instruments, and Dr. Anna Stork, who supervised me during my internship in third year. In earth sciences, it can get especially isolating being the only female in the group full of guys for field work. So having um, Anna and Ophelia around really helped me a lot. Uh, other than that, I was also uh, interested in joining hackathons. Uh, here's one where we won a free VR headset. Um, I also applied for the Alan Turing Enrichment Scheme for extra funding and AI resources. Aside from um, making your CV look really good for applications, it was also really fun. Um, and a really funny story about this picture um, is that after this picture was taken, a female staff came up to me and said, oh, this is amazing. Do you know that you're the only girl here who participated in this hackathon? And I was shocked because I didn't even notice. Um, maybe because I was participating with my friends who were all guys. <laughs> but apparently it was true. So moral of the story is that we need more women to join hackathons. Um, my general advice to other women who are interested in a career in STEM is to talk to, uh, network and catch up with people. So peers in your cohort, uh, supervisors or lecturers that teach the topics that you enjoy. Um, ask around for opportunities. Uh, so people like your tutors, universities, department, and apply to all sorts, um, like hackathons, summer schools, workshops to get that sweet experience. Um, also, interestingly, social media can really help boost your presence as a woman in STEM. Um, I used to post about my experiences and photos from field trips on Twitter, and this slowly turned from a personal account to a semi-academic account. 
Um, Twitter has a lot of uh, resources like um, internships, uh, people who post them, uh, opportunities. And in general, there are a lot of um, more experienced people out there on this platform that um, can help guide your way uh, through academia. So make a Twitter account or have your own website or blog. Um, side note, please follow me on Twitter at swarls underscore limb or free, fill, uh, free, free to uh, look at my website, cindylim.com. <laughs> um, right, anyway, let me just segue onto my research. Um, my current research is about using deep learning to detect induced seismicity in uh, large high frequency borehole data sets, which are common in geoenergy uh, projects. Geoenergy projects like shale gas, uh, like for shale gas, uh, geothermal energy or carbon capture and storage can potentially induce seismicity. Um, these projects require um, micro seismic monitoring as induced seismicity pose serious risks to communities and infrastructure. Here are some case examples of a water disposal sites, um, a geothermal site, and a shale gas site, all inducing earthquakes with magnitudes up to 5.7. These projects were either halted or disrupted as a result. Another important example is in Groningen, um, Netherlands. Uh, it was the largest conventional um, gas field in Europe until it slowly induced earthquakes up to 3.6. Unfortunately, this damaged a lot of buildings and infrastructure, causing a lot of public protests and billions lost in revenue. I've prepared a little animation over here to show what that looks like. Yes, uh, quite like that. Um, these case studies uh, emphasize the importance of micro uh, monitoring micro seismicity. Um, the issue is um, micro seismic monitoring typically produces large uh, seismic data sets up to terabytes of data. One solution to this is using deep learning to detect phase arrivals for earthquakes. Many studies have found uh, that deep learning phase picking models could detect more events, could detect them faster, and can be applied to large data sets easily as well as they are um, less computationally intensive. Um, deep learning enhanced catalogs could be beneficial for improving risk mitigation strategies. For example, in a real-time traffic light system, we could obtain a more complete picture of uh, seismicity at the subsurface and use that to track fluid migration pathways, for example. And we can study the spatial temporal distribu distribution of seismicity to better understand the mechanisms of induced seismicity. For my study, I use the PNR1Z dataset. Um, it is a large dataset from the Preston New Road hydraulic fracturing site in Blackpool, UK. This is where a moratorium on hydraulic fracturing was imposed after a series of induced earthquakes. This data set recorded hydraulic fracturing activities on the PNR1Z well, which is here in green, on 24 borehole geophones in red on the PNR2 um, well. Um, here they recorded up to 3.1 terabytes of uh, seismic data at high sampling rates, uh, high sampling frequencies of 2000 Hertz. SlumberJ initially used a method uh, based on the coalescence micro uh, seismic mapping method by Drew et al. We call this the CMM method. Um, this is a multi station event detection and location method, which is very computationally intensive. In fact, it was so computationally in intensive that they had to send, a, send the data to a supercomputer in Houston. Uh, here they found uh, more than 38,000 events. Um, so these are the scientific questions I'd like to answer in my research. Can pre-existing, pre-trained models detect induced seismicity on high-frequency borehole data? Which model performs the best and why? And to remind you, um, the models were uh, all trained on uh, 100 hertz uh, surface station data that contained regional size earthquakes. Um, Whereas in our data, we have micro seismic events uh, recorded at way higher frequencies from a borehole array. And secondly, can these um, deep learning models detect additional earthquakes that were not initially cataloged? Um, these are the deep learning models that I use in my study. 
it's the GPD model, the UGPD model, EQ transformer, and the FaceNet model. Um, these models were all trained on 100 hertz three component seismograms on surface uh, seismic stations, except for FaceNet, uh, because they also included data from different types of instruments. For my study, I compared the resulting event catalogs from each of these models. And what I mean by a catalog is a list of earthquake origin times. I use the initial CMM catalog as my ground truth. And here I defined a detection as P phase picks from at least four different stations. And here are my results. On the left are bar charts of each catalog showing um, the firstly, the CMM uh, catalog here in blue and uh, recall and Basically, uh, I show each catalog uh, that shows the same uh, events recalled from, uh, from the CMM catalog, uh, the miss events in red and the new events in yellow. And here we can see that PhaseNet produced the best results, um, showing a 95% uh, recall from the initial catalog and about a 40% uh, percent increase in new events. On the right is a temporal plot uh, showing the cumulative uh, number of events uh, from each catalog overlaid with injection rates throughout the whole PNR1Z data. Here, we can also see that PhaseNet did the best for event detection on our data. And back, uh, back to the questions I posed from before. Uh, yes, it is possible for the existing models to detect uh, hydraulic fracturing induced seismicity, on high frequency borehole data, PhaseNet showed the best results, identifying about 95% of the initial catalog with a 40% increase in the number of um, new events. Um, this might be due to uh, exposure to different types of uh, instrument data during training. And yes, uh, these deep learning models can detect additional earthquakes that were not initially cataloged. And at most, over uh, 15,000 events were not cataloged. And looking at the bigger picture, um, with this, we can have enhanced deep learning catalogs that can potentially uh, reveal uh, new insights uh, into the mechanisms that control induced seismicity. We can also improve risk mitigation strategies. For example, it gives us a faster workflow, and so it gives us more time for decision-making during real-time traffic light systems. That's the end of my presentation. Uh, thanks everyone for listening, and thanks to the Comet Women's Network, Chi, Natalie, Rachel, and Laura for inviting me to give this talk. I'm really excited to hear the different perspectives and experiences from more professional women in academia, Dr. Lin Shen and uh, Dr. Sam Engwell, um, coming up next. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Cindy. So we have a live audience at Leeds, and then there's also a live audience at Bristol, and there are also uh, audience from the online. Uh, let's have maybe uh, one or two questions in total. Uh, let's see uh, where questions come up first. Yes, please. Um, great talk, Cindy. Uh, Thank you. I <laughs> uh, my, my question is about the uh, new uh, hello. <laughs> the new uh, arrivals that um, PhaseNet found. Did you go and verify any of the new arrivals to see if there was if you actually found any new events or whether it was kind of false positive? Yes. Um, so I. Um... I managed to validate these new events um, by assuming that um, a real earthquake event uh, will be traveling uh, linearly uh, along the linear uh, borehole. And, and I assume that if the picks align and have the same gradient as um, the velocity of a P wave in shale, then those are, uh, those are real events. And so here um, you can see that actually um, FaceNet found about 80% new events, but through uh, through this method that I just um, described, I managed to filter out uh, like half of them were real. And so I did check 
on the new events. <laughs> Great. There's no question from online. There is one. Oh, there's oh okay Q and A. Here we go. Uh, why does the uh, yeah. e EQT model perform so badly? Uh, yeah. Um. So what the EQT um does is that it has a global view on um earthquakes, and what that just means is that it looks in the data for like what an earthquake looks like. And then it assumes that in the same window, the P and the S phase will arrive about, um, about where it tells it to look. And because um, it, because my data was high frequency, so it, it just, like there's more points in between the two phases and it will look different on phase uh, EQT. So it just didn't work on my um, data set. So, yeah. Um, I think there's a question here in Russell. It's a great question. When they um, have to send the master data set to EQT, yeah. do they physically have to? No, I think, I'm not, I don't know. I think. It's a good play in the hard drive. <laughs> yeah, um, I think. Oh, uh, so someone asked me if they actually flew the data to Houston. And sorry, this might be not a correct representation of what they did. They probably um, uploaded the data, which is 3.1 terabytes onto like a server, but that takes like such a long time compared to just running the um, models on your laptop. Yeah. Cool. Um... <laughs> Okay, uh, there are more uh, more questions coming up, both uh, uh, online and the Q&A panel, and uh, there's actually an impressive question here from the Leeds audience, but uh, uh, for the interest of time. Uh... Yeah, thank you for having me here, and thank everyone for being here, and also the people online. And I'm Lynn from University of Leeds, and now a postdoc uh, working both in the earthquake and also the uh, volcano things. And so for today's presentation, I made some change for about the topic I would like to show. And so it's like for today's presentation, I'd like to show you the uh, the work we have recently done for constraint uh, uh, 2018, Mark Hughes 5 Pilot Earthquake uh, from the cosmic surface information, information using GPS and INSA data. And this is kind of like a collaborating project with the people from the Mailing groups, and I'd like to thank for their contribution on this work. Yeah, so for the 2018, this devastating earthquake, uh, the Palu magnitude 7.5 earthquake, a ruptured along the uh, Palu Cairo Street Fleet Fault uh, in the southwestern part of the Sinawan Sea in Indonesia. And this event was quickly followed by the tsunami waves arrived in two to five minutes after the rupture. And this Palu Karo fold is uh, it runs underneath the Palu City region and it accommodates about four meter per year lake lateral street fleet rate. And according to the GPS measurements, the segment at the Palu Bay and also the valley uh, is locked at very shallow depths that is down to 12 kilometers and which means uh, a steady accumulation of the fleet deficit. So if we look at the map, the fault uh, is out of the surface from the south and then through the Palu Valley and also continues over the Palu Bay to the north. So it will be not very clear about the rupture over the Bay region, uh, but based on this kind of system, we can, uh, imagine is a kind of like a trans-tensional system, which it also allows the possibility 
for the deep sleep components uh, to increase the vertical surface displacement during the earthquake. So from the perspective of the tsunami, gener tsunami generation, there is an important question to answer. That is, was the tsunami generated by the seismic deformation, or it is a result of the secondary result uh, effects uh, such as the submarine landslide? So it's like there have been a lot of studies for this earthquake before showing the cause of me modeling results. So for the full slides, I'll show you what we have done differently with the data and also the model. Yeah, sorry about the missing figure, but actually it will show the GPS uh, displacement we uh, have for this earthquake. Uh, so this is kind of like a unique GPS data we got. Um, so it's like for the previous studies, there has no this uh, requirement to the GPS, <clears throat> which we include uh, 35 campaign GPS and also the five uh, continuous GPS operational uh, near this Palu fault region. And also, combined with the GPS, we also using the um, SAR, multiple SAR derived data uh, that is uh, from the, the uh, five different orbit spheres of the ALOS L band mm -hmm. SAR data, including one pair of the SCANSA mode and also four pairs of the street map model. So this includes the INSA data and also the multiple aperture infometry, the range of that, and also the asthma of that. And so compared to INSA, the MAI and the range of that and the asthma of that have the lower precision to INSA. But if we look at the data coverage, they will have a good coverage for the whole earthquake region. So that will be provide a complete uh, view of the 3D cost uh, seismic displacement to this event. And this uh, lower panel also showing the uh, comparison between the SAR derived data and also the GPS data we have, which should show in this missing figure. <laughs> so it's like we can see the very general uh, good agreements between these two data. So then we used uh, 16 fold segments to characterize the fault geometry of this very uh, large scale event, um, including 13 strictly domlet segments from the south to the north that we show in the red color, that is from the segment A to M. This is also including the four fold bands, that is B, uh, G, H, I, and the T here, which differs in the strike to the uh, general north-south strike. And we also incorporate two deep, uh, the normal fault, that is segment O here, and also the segment across the peninsula, that is, we incorporate from the, the star derived data. And for the fault segment below the bay, uh, here we, uh, characterized into three segments, that is F, A, G, and H. And for the segment F and H, they are probably uh, unsure. So it's like their strike is linked to their unsure part. Or, and for the G is the connection part for the south and the north part of the Palu segment. And because we do not have the direct of uh, the operation of the course to this uh, shallow rupture below the bay. 
So we also consider multiple uh, tectonically feasible uh, categories for the geom for geometry uh, below the palube. And so for the first case, uh, we may consume that uh, it's like uh, this shallow bay region could include the late lateral straight leaf fold um, that is as a continuous uh, of the, the onshore parts. And then this part will be connect this north and south part of the Palu basic Palu segments. So in the scenario one, we consider the segment H and also F as the for the segment H as the full band because we find it will differ in the strike to the other segments over the bay. Um, and for the segment A and H as the, the uh, strict slip segments. And this will, because of the strict slip fold, uh, these are the strict slip fold segments in the left lateral. So this full band will be, uh, 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 it will be kind of like uh, to accommodate the thrusting in the deep sleep component. And for scenario two, uh, it's based on the, uh, the same idea, but we're here just allowing the uh, gradual change uh, for the full band from the segment G to H. Uh, so it's like both uh, H and G segments here are the full bands, uh, while the, for the segment F also considered as the strict sleep. And for the, the third scenario, we just explore the possibility that for all the base segments, they are the strict sleep fold. And another case is that for some studies, they show that actually the surface, the tsunami should be uh, relatively south to the bay, uh, which means because we can say that for the scenario one, two, three, uh, these four bands are in the north part of the bay. So for this, under this, uh, for this scenario, we consider that we move the four band from the northern segment to the middle part, that is the segment G here as the, the four band. And then we have the two segments to connect this G. So here we also fixed, in this scenario, also fixed the length of the segment H uh, as 10 kilometer to accommodate to the uh, 117 seconds, the time, the travel time contour, uh, which showed by the previous study. And for the scenario five, uh, it's kind of like a similar uh, uh, scenario, but it, here in this scenario, we just uh, allows a uh, strike, the free strike for the southern part of the bay segment. And for the last scenario, we also explore the possible, the discontinuity for the band region, which means we are not include any uh, four bands to connect the north and south part of the bay uh, of the Palu segment. So that will be result in a step over between the segments F and also segment H. So, and then based on this uh, fault, uh, we have UI uh, and using a Bayesian inversion to sample the uh, posterior probability density function. Uh, we here we derived the, so this figure showing the medium sleep uh, distribution for all the both segments. So the one thing we can infer from this result is that we find a very shallow sleep for most of the, the southern part of the fold, uh, which we can find the very peak sleep uh, in the upper seven kilometers and right up to the surface. While for the northern part of the bay, uh, we find it's like the, because the, for the SAR data, it shows that the rupture do not uh, reach to the surface. However, we still find the, the sleep uh, previous uh, for the, on the segments in the upper seven kilometers segments. So it's like in general, it's hard for us to find the uh, sleep 
larger than five meters in this uh, very long, deep uh, cross basin segments we incorporate in the model. And this figure below showing the uh, the sleep distribution we derived from the model for the six scenarios we just mentioned for the bay segment for the bay region. And from this sleep distribution, uh, the important finding is that for all of the scenarios, we find a very significant deep sleep on the four six, uh, for, for the four bench. Uh, so this is expected for the scenario one and also scenario two, because we incorporate uh, uh, kind of like a four bench to enforce serious thrusting on that four bench. But for the scenario three and four, actually we do not have this kind of like the uh, setting for the fourth model, but they're still showing the thrusting distributed over these basic bands in these two scenarios. And also for observed band that is 16 B here, that is a releasing band, we also find a very significant uh, deep sleep component on that segment. So, so uh, to how to uh, kind of like expand these results. So if we look at the GPS data uh, for this Bay region, that is showing us the horizontal displacement in the this panel and also the vertical displacement, we'll find that uh, we can better or can only explain the uh, GPS observations after we incorporating the deep sleep in our uh, base segment. So here, if we see the gray arrows showing the uh, observations and we find for the yellow arrows, uh, it's showing the better fit to the observations after incorporating the deep sleep components to the basic segments. And then based on the modeling results, we derived the core seismic bisymmetry chains below the bay for each scenario. And here I also show the, uh, the six points that we have the tsunami observations. Uh, so by for the first three scenario, we'll find the uplift dominate in the uh, northern segment of the bay, uh, which was bad because we have to put the four band here. And for the scenario four and five, this uh, uplift uh, is shift to the south. And, for, and then for the last scenario, the scenario six, uh, you will have the uh, smaller uplap because we are not allowed the full bend in the base segment in the bay region and just leave that just step over. And then based on this uh, estimate uh, bathymetry change, we compare it to uh, derive the uh, wave uh, amplitude and then compare with the, the observed uh, video with waveforms for this six size. And then we can find is for the first uh, three scenarios, we find there the estimate about the arrival time of the tsunami is too early for the northern side uh, Pantano and also the Veni. So we kind of discard these three scenarios in our later modeling. And for the scenario four, uh, sorry, the five, it underestimates the wave amplitude in the Palu City that side. So we also remove that from our uh, candidate. And based on the comparison, we find the scenario six, uh, four will be our preferred uh, scenario because it can explain the wave amplitude for most of the sites very well. And also it does a relatively good job to predicting the time of the first arrival of the tsunami. That is showing us the magenta lines in the uh, in this figure, and then we also compare the uh, model run up to the run up survey data, uh, which showing us that by using the core seismic uh, derived displacement, we can model the comparable run height. Uh, for the most <laughs> of the Palu region, uh, and especially for the west part of the, the region, we can model this eight meters height uh, 
for from our cost estimate displacement. And also, like our modeling results showing that uh, it also prefers that uh, the model for the fourth model it will, uh, should include the four bands in our uh, in our model to kind of uh, match with the data we observe from these sites. Uh, however, for the northern two sites, that is Veni and uh, Panama, there is a, a term, there is kind of like a, on the estimate of the run-up heights for these two sites. So we uh, interpret it as a long tectonic feature caused by the coast dis displacement. So how do we explain this based on the modeling results and or the, the coast and modeling results and also tsunami results? So here our in, uh, inspiration is that um, we interpret this region as a transitional basin structure. Uh, that is uh, based on the presence of the, the shallow part of the normal and also the strict floating events and also combined with a deep fault below the Palu Bay. And this is interpreted as a negative flower structure, uh, which will find the deep angle of the folds uh, is changed with the uh, with depth, and then it converged at depths to a very uh, single and steep fold. So this is also um, consistent with what, with what we have found from our sleep um, distribution, that is we have the smaller deep angle for the shallow parts of the folds, but we have very steep uh, deep angle for the deep cross basin segment. And also we uh, infer uh, four bend uh, is over the, uh, the bay region to kind of like collect the two parallel uh, folds that is from the south to the north. And for these four bands over uh, for the observed four bands that is like the signal B here and also the four bands across the Palu Bay, we interpret it as they have accommodate with uh, the very significantly deep sleep uh, deep sleep components to uh, kind of uh, increase the, the vertical displacement over the earthquake. So it's like we from this interpretation we can find that based on the single source of the uh, cost estimate deformation displacement we can use that to model a tsunami that is matched with the operations from the local uh, video data. So our conclusion for this part is that we conclude the cost estimate uh, deformation is a major cause to the tsunami of the uh, 2018 Palu earthquake uh, instead of the secondary effects such as the, the landslide. And here in this study, we used a very unique geodesic data uh, combined the GPS and also the multiple star-derived data to better constrain the vertical deformation over the Palu region. And here we um, interpret that, we infer that uh, the fourth band uh, below the Palu Bay is uh, has accommodate the significant deep sleep uh, motions for this earthquake. Uh, although we do not have the direct observations to the cause of the shallow rupture below the bay, so from these results, we find that the fault bands uh, have played a very major role to generating the uh, tsunami for the strict sleep events. So that can take. Uh, can shed some light for the other strictly events in the future. Yeah, thank you. Great. Thank you, Ling. Uh, let's see if we have uh, questions from Beats or Bristol or online. That's it. Oh, we have 10 minutes. Okay, uh, any questions? Let's type in uh, answers yeah. <laughs> on the chat. 